often I get to go and talk about STEAM. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to talk about my development with STEAM. So it's pretty exciting to talk from that angle. STEAM is not a new curriculum. It is a framework for teaching because I am very left and right brained. Things have to make sense to me. And when I came into education, things did not make a lot of sense to me. And so I wanted to find a framework for teaching as I went into education that was more representative of how people learn naturally, but still could be combined with the public education sector. And those two things don't often go well together. So education has come a long way. And as I've looked at the history of education, I have found people from the 1400s like Comenius or Montessori, Jane Addams, and John Dewey from you know, the 20s and 30s. And of course, we all know they had some fabulous ideas. And because I taught in technology education and engineering, we did a lot with the design circle. And the more I meshed my research in education with the engineering design circle, the more I realized that I was working on education from an engineering standpoint. How can I engineer education to be better designed? So I went through and I evaluated and I planned and I reevaluated and I redesigned. And I do this every day that I wake up. I reevaluate the STEAM matrix and how well it's working based on what's happened in the world in the last 24 hours. So in order to understand my perspective and how I came here, I think it's important to understand a little bit about my background. There's a certain bond that people have if they were raised by immigrants, especially immigrants that went through the Great Depression. They have their own viewpoint on the United States, on the world, and I was mostly raised by my grandparents. My grandfather was an electrical engineer for Grumman Electronics, and he worked on the, engineer, the electrical system that went into the first modular landing on the moon. So he didn't want his kids to be brought up in Long Island, in New York City. They had an apartment there, but he decided he was gonna buy a 200-acre farm upstate and keep my Puerto Rican grandmother and her children and their children there, and they were the first Hispanic family in this really rural upstate New York town. And that was very hard on her and the children. But she grew up where she gave up the Puerto Rican debutante lifestyle. She moved to New York City to tell her family, I don't need this lifestyle, I can do it without you. She was always the tomboy and in trouble and very lively. So I got his very strict engineering mindset and I got her very loose, creative, humanistic mindset. And um, at 12, they brought me to Puerto Rico for an extended period of time. And my grandfather and I built that house in that lower picture. We hired one person to help us with concrete, and he and I together designed and built a house. That's pretty empowering for a 12-year-old to have built a house. And at that point, I said, wow, you know, Grandpa, we're doing some really cool things. And he said something to me that I will absolutely never forget, and it made me very much who I am today. He said, you're really smart. And I was like, cool, Grandpa thinks I'm smart. He said, you're going to make a great engineer's wife someday. <laughs> so there are days that I wish that I could wake him up and say, guess who teaches engineering? <laughs> um, the reason I was raised mostly by my grandparents is my mother has Asperger's, almost autism. And my little brother has Asperger's as well. If you've had students with Asperger's, you know that they can be quite challenging. Having a parent with Asperger's, almost autism, is very challenging. So I grew up with this mindset that there are so many different ways to learn from people no matter what their skills or deficits. And there's so many ways to teach other people. And that's so ingrained into my core. So my younger brother up there is an excellent representative of Ms. Cantor's statement, the top 100% of our students. And I am more proud of him for getting through high school and going on to community college than I am of graduating Virginia Tech with high honors. He works harder in many ways than most of our students ever have to work for his achievements. Now, another thing that I've learned is my little crazy Puerto Rican grandma still lives with us. She's 89 years old. She has Alzheimer's. And I teach her some of the same things every day, all day long. And we go over some of the same things. 
but STEAM works just as well for her as it does for my children when they were in the sandbox. And so one of the really cool things about what I've been able to develop is that it's really universal for age. There is no point where it works or it doesn't work. So that was very exciting to me. Um, I also had a big influence from the arts. My mother married an artist at one point, and he did that portrait of me as a child. And so I had this great influx of intense engineering, intense art, and this kind of wild, creative homemaker of my grandmother. So I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer or an architect. And upon going into college, it wasn't too long before I got pregnant. And I just said, you know, I don't want to spend all of my time in school when I have young children. I'm going to go and do something easier. I'm going to take clothing and textiles design as a bachelor's degree. But I was never one of those in-the-box people. So they said, OK, design an outfit with one uh, seam. And I designed an outfit all made out of zippers. Then I went and I became the uh, vice president of a company in Ecuador. And I got to teach 140 people all the time how to make clothes. And that was fascinating. Then I decided I was away from my kids 70, 80 hours a week. I wasn't being the parent I wanted to be. I gave up going to Ecuador and flying around the country for shows. And I went back to school to get an education degree. Well, I had to pay for my children. So I decided I was going to start designing houses. No architecture degree. I was just going to do it. And I did it. So I designed a bunch of houses and redesigned a bunch of historical houses in town. And that was really neat. I went to Virginia Tech, and I took technology education. The reason I took it is because, to me, technology education is where all your other subjects come together. You can do math, science, English, social studies, everything. And it all comes together in that classroom, and you get to make stuff. So that was really neat. And it's necessary for everybody to understand a modern world to be technically literate. Around that time, NSF coined the phrase STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Our department moved from being technology education department to the first integrated STEM department in the world. And it was based on the fact that if you teach all these things in relation to each other, they make more sense and it's more ingrained. So I went through all the standards, and I started looking for commons. And I had somebody, a professor, say to me something else that changed my life. He said, you're one person, and you're really biting off a lot here. One person can't change the world. And I was like, what did you just say to me? And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, you know. I said, Hitler, Gandhi, haven't heard of them. I'm going to try to be somewhere in between. Let's see what I can do. Um, so communication is really important. And it's not just what is written, it's how it's interpreted. And that hit me hard. And the social studies, I think that we're more aligned in STEM with social studies and the history of the development of things than we are necessarily between math and science themselves. So to me, that said, you have to include the arts. Okay, there is, STEM is not great without the arts. We've all seen engineers that design ugly things or that aren't ergonomic or they can't talk about what they do. But we've all seen IKEA directions. That's all math. And they, they can transfer things through pictures in art and the language of mathematics. So it became very important to me to really look at the artistic element of STEM. I also made sure that STEAM had all of the basic backing that it needed. It is representative of all these different teaching theories and learning theories that we've heard a lot about. So somebody said to me, why are you doing this? I said, well, it's important to teach people how to learn. You can teach people how to learn? Yes, you can teach people how to learn. Because if people don't know how to learn, they become stagnant, and they become like my poor grandmother who still can't program a VCR. You have to be able to grow with the times. You have to be able to be an informed user and evaluate your needs, wants, and opportunities. So understanding where your opportunities are is really valuable. And that was a very important part of STEAM. So to me, it boiled down to functional literacy. I left industry not because I wanted to make a bunch of less money to be altruistic and teach. And I tell my students, the worst thing that you can do is ruin my good time in a classroom, because then as an educator, we don't make enough money to not have a good time doing what we're doing. And so my classroom is very intense, but it's also very fun. 
And we do things like ultimate recycling. And the game in the middle is a game for blind students to learn the different regions of Virginia. And so all of this started really coming together. And I said, OK, this is where I need to really have like a summation sentence of what STEAM is. And I kept racking my brain and writing down different things and reading through research. And we know that there is no true holistic education that can be taught. Everybody interprets things differently. So if you talk to identical twins and you tell them identically the same thing, they're going to interpret it slightly differently. You cannot control holistic education. But you can understand the structure of what you're teaching people and show and point out all the different things that relate to each other and try to make it as holistic as you can. So this is what I came up with. Science is the natural world. It's what we've been given. Technology is everything designed up to this point. So if you want to take the world forward, which we all do, that's what you're given to start with. It's all interpreted through the act of engineering, which is creating more technology, and the arts, which is not just the fine arts, but the liberal arts, the social arts, the manual arts. And everything is understood in a basic language of math. Now, the mathematicians have proved that math is the basic language, and I'm not going to take the time. But if you're going to argue with that, I'd love to argue with you about that, because it blew me away when I saw the Kuhnian revolution of mathematics and realized it really is the underlying language of everything. And there's a purity to it that's just beautiful. So what I wanted to do was working out. And I was creating a place where everybody could learn from each other and where I could be a continuous learner. They could further investigate any topic, and they could fully participate, whether they were an advanced learner or whether they were somebody with difficulties. And what I realized is all my learners are advanced in one way or more and have difficulties in one way or more. And the assessment, the last thing that I was going to do in my classroom was give kids bubble sheet tests. It was just not going to happen. And I got kids to do more paperwork by not requiring a test at the end and keeping track in a portfolio as they had their brainstorm ideas and their epiphanies than I did at giving them a test at the end. And then I found out that that really strengthened their abilities to do well on their tests in other classes. So the other teachers were happy with what I was doing as well. So I had a team because my, the school I went to work with was very rural, very poor Appalachia. They'd never had an engineering program before, and they were not going to let me have an engineering program. So I started an after-school engineering club, and we decided that we were going to tackle a national engineering competition. And the um, assignment was to do an engineered prom design, and we decided to base it on the periodic table of elements because most of my students would never take chemistry or physics. And so I wanted to get some upper-level chemistry and physics into their curriculum. So I had kids who would never talk to each other. Cheerleaders, and they use the term, so I'm not using it badly, rednecks, and you know, super religious kids, and super kids into heavy metal. And they would never talk to each other in the hallway. And they all ended up on my team. And they bonded amazing. And this is the outfit that we made. We won first place nationals our first year out as a team. And uh, we had a blast, and we actually had um, these people who are really knowledgeable about the elements send us real elements to put on the inside of the jacket. And for the radioactive ones, we had those little glow sticks, so he glowed as he walked down the runway. And my kids learned more about geometry and all those other things, science, chemistry, than they did in their other classes. The rewards were fabulous. There were some problems. One of them stabbed themselves. We ended up in the hospital during nationals. You know, <laughs> nothing ever goes smoothly. Um, and this face of mine is just the epitome of, what have I done? And I would feel that way every day for like 30 seconds. I'd wake up and go, oh no, what am I going to do today? How are we going to get through today? And then I'd be like, that's all right. Kids got it. Um, so STEAM is about where all effort is encouraged. It's representative of the surrounding culture. Korea just adopted it as the new way to teach across the nation, K-12. I was there this summer. That was an incredible experience. Um, it's benchmarked. It can be done inexpensively. Administrators love to hear that. There's a transportation curriculum that I give. There's a course that I base where I turn it upside down and I say, this is where you are. Where do you want to get to? These are the roads you can take. And that's what I have to share with you this morning. Thank you.